Okay guys, I want to go over your quiz results real quickly and go over some common problems you guys were having. Um, most of you did well on 1 to 3, but many of you struggled on number 4. I think the most important thing to remember is that when we talk about opportunity cost, we're talking about the cost of running one lap. So my cost of running one lap is going to be that I give up a certain amount of swim laps can't run and swim at the same time. Therefore, when I'm swimming, I give up the ability to run laps. So not understanding that was the source of a good amount of trouble for you guys. So, you know, I'm going to call the units SL and RL, and here's our correct answers here. So when I run 40 laps, I give up the ability to swim 60. But when we talk about opportunity cost, we always want to be talking in terms of one. When I run one lap, it, gives, uh, it, it makes me give up the ability to swim 1.5 laps. Now that might seem weird because Edna's the best runner and not the best swimmer, so how come she can run more laps than she can swim? Well, it's a 400 meter track versus a 50 meter pool, so obviously we're talking on a different scale. So those are the right answers there if you want to... Um, I assume Miss Barton has given you back your papers by now, and you can kind of look at what you did, but let's work a few out. Before we do that, let's go over something real basic. If I, if I were to set this up for you here, 1 half equals x over 24, all of you guys instantly know it's 12, I assume. But why? Uh, you know, and it's one of those things that it's we all do it all the time, but maybe you've forgotten why. Well, what we're really doing there, the way we can figure that out mathematically, other than just seeing it, is to cross multiply and divide. So what we're saying is that this 1 is to 2 the exact same way that x is to 24, but we don't know x. So we can do 2 times x is equal to 24 times 1. So then we have our variable, we divide by 2 and divide by 2, and of course, we all know that x is equal to 12. I say that because some of you, many of you, uh, all of those that I, told, that I told you, you switched your division, basically, you set up your ratio wrong. So let's look at Edna. We're saying that she can run 40 or swim 60. Um, so we're saying that 40 is equal to 60. Now again, don't go tell your math teachers that, but we're saying that in one hour she can run 40 or swim 60, therefore both of these are equal to you know, an hour's worth of effort. So now we want to figure out, well, 40 is equal to 60, but what is one lap equal to? Well, we don't know, that's our variable. So most of you did this, uh, not most of you, those of you who struggled here, Instead of doing 40 over 1, you did 40 over 60, and that ends up getting your, um, it ends up getting your uh, answers into the wrong column. Um, right answer, wrong place, essentially. So 40 is to 1, and 60 is to x, so we do 40 times x is equal to 60 times 1, divide by 40, and x is equal to 1.5. Now look, something else we need to pay attention to. We see that Edna... She can swim more laps in an hour than she can run laps, even though she's a better runner than Ava and Miranda. But 40 is a smaller number than 60. So when we talk about 1, this answer here, well, it's got to be bigger than 1, just like 60 is bigger than 40. So oftentimes when you do this, I always like to step away from it and think, well, you know, logically, what's it got to be? And then also... We can see when we look at our three numbers here that Edna's the biggest, Marinda's next, and then Ava's the least. Well, this should reflect that same pattern. So Edna's the biggest and has the lowest opportunity cost, Ava's the smallest and has the highest opportunity cost, and Marinda's in the middle and her opportunity cost is in the middle. And you see those same patterns are reflected over here in the other column. So. I'm not a math teacher, but if I were, I would plead with you guys to think about mathematics logically and just go, well, wait a minute, does my answer make sense? Um, this is why math teachers are always on you to, uh, 
double check your answers and all that. So the same here. Okay, let's look at question five. By law, by far and away, the biggest problem people had here is they didn't put in any intermediary points. So you ended up producing a straight line between your two values here. I didn't deduct for it because maybe it wasn't worded correctly, but I did ask for fundraising outcomes here. So it would make sense if you express this in euro in the value. Um, but some of you did it in laps and that was okay. Um, so I didn't deduct specifically there. But here, if you notice the way I set this up, so each of these columns, so the total amount of laps that could be run was 100, and 100 times 10 is 1,000 euro. And the maximum amount of laps that could be swam would be 250, and 250 times 4 was also 1,000. So it would seem like to the non-economist that 1,000 was the, most, the highest amount that could be um, raised. But we'll see that that's not true. So what we need to look at here is, okay, if we, have, if we start at this, this dot where everyone is running, how can we do better than 1,000? Well, what if we just have the best two runners run and the best swimmer swim? Well, that would be the best two runners are, according to opportunity cost, are Edna, she has the lowest, and then Marinda has the next lowest. Um, so that would be 40 and 35 for 75. So 75 times 10 is 750. And we see that value here. I think the uh, y-axis goes second, but if that's wrong, excuse me. That leaves Eva, Eva to swim, and she can swim 100 for 4, so that's the 400 that you saw. Okay, so that's the next point down would be to take the best swimmer, and instead of have them run like she's doing here, we're going to have the best swimmer swim, and that's going to give us this point. If we have the second best swimmer swim, that would be Marinda. Let's see. Yeah, Marinda. That's going to make the total amount of running only Edna's, 40 times 10, so 400. And then the swimmers will be 100 times 90, which we see over here somewhere. Um, I'm sorry, 190, 190 uh, times 4 and that's 760. So we see actually that this option right here would raise not a thousand euro, but it would raise uh, 760 plus 400, so 1160 euro. So that would be the best fundraising option there. Wasn't actually a question, but we can see that. Okay, so make sure you pl plot in those intermediate points. It's really the important part of the PPC. Okay, for number six, um, I anticipated two responses. I think one of you did this over to the left, and then most, well, most of you didn't do this very well, but a few of you tried this option over to the right. Um, look, if our three athletes aren't training, you could argue that their potential, the PPC, is unmoved, but they're operating somewhere inside of their potential at A. And through training, or getting back into training, they're going to get closer and closer and closer to the PPC, which would be point B. I was saying, or I was trying to get to, you know, if maybe I'm the world's greatest yo-yoer, but I never yo-yo, I've never practiced, well, I'm not going to be very good at it. I guess maybe a better example is if, you know, Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo had, you know, never picked up a football, would they be good football players? Well, no, they wouldn't be. Um, so obviously you have to train and learn a sport uh, before you actually get good at it. So I guess what I was getting at is if they don't train at all and never practice, their potential is going to be very low. So again, likewise, you know, if you look at Lionel Messi on his first day of, uh, you know, playing football when he was five years old or something, um, his potential wasn't very great, but he made his potential better by training and growing and getting stronger and all that. So anyway, whatever, either of these is legitimate, it didn't really matter. If you took this second route, you should have shown an outward shift. I would have deducted for not putting that arrow in, so there we go. You need to show the PPC shifting. Also, you would have labeled these. Sorry, I'm 
kind of fanatic about labels. Um, and then all these lines that you see I have in here, all these dotted lines, let me talk about those. Many of you struggled with seven because you struggled with six. But for those of you who did well with six, I think on almost all of your papers, I said refer specifically to your graph. So you need to do what I've done here, which is to bring down from the points that you're going to talk about, so point A and point B, bring down to the axis and give it some sort of value. You could base it on the diagram above and, you know, whatever this would be. It would be, I don't know, 100 and, I don't know, 125 or something like that. And, you know, this would have been maybe 50 and 65. It doesn't even matter. I mean, you can call it S1 and S2 with R1. The point is that you can't talk very well about, uh, you can't give a very good analysis if you're just talking in general terms. So now with this, I can say, well, at point A, they're only able to produce, you know, 50 uh, laps and 100 swimming. But when they train, they can increase their running laps to 65 and their swimming laps to 125. That's a much better conversation. It's specific. Here, I can say, well, through training, they shift their PPC out. So if they continue to produce R1 laps, instead of producing only S1 laps on the new PPC, they can produce S2 laps, which is a greater amount. And again, that specificity makes my analysis much more uh, meaningful.